Today we are celebrating the accomplishment of Professor Ezzat Idris. Uh, Professor Ezzat Idris has been in our profession for many, many decades. And we'll start a little bit uh, with the sort of early years. Professor Idris received his bachelor's degree from RPI in 1958, his MS in civil engineering from Caltech in 1959, and his PhD in civil engineering at the University of California, Berkeley in 1966. Professor Idris's career is, stands as an example for all of us in terms of advancing the profession while conducting fundamental research to understand the underlying mechanisms that are always vexing us. Uh, Professor Idris's immediately after his uh, academic career, he went into engineering practice, worked for nearly two decades uh, at a number of firms, mostly at Woodward Clyde Consultants, and then he switched back to academia where he became a professor uh, at the University of California, Davis, and then he is now Professor Emeritus at the University of California, Davis, but continues to be active in both research and consulting. Whether he was working in consulting or in academia, he never stopped having a, another foot in the other area. So during his academic, his practice career, he was actively involved in teaching and in research at a number of institutions, including University of California, Davis, and in his, um, and, sorry, University of California, Berkeley, and then in his academic career, he continued to be actively involved in consulting. Professor Idris has contributed in to many areas of geotechnical engineering, and particularly geotechnical earthquake engineering. We all know about the program, the software Shake. Uh, Professor Idris is the pioneer who introduced us to this technique, which we all use in our practice. It's not just about the program, it's about the ideas, the concepts that were behind it that he made available to all of us and encouraged all of us to think about the role of soil in ground motion, modification, amplification, attenuation. Professor Idris's work on liquefaction is something that we use in everyday life in our practice, and he continued throughout his career to update, enhance, improve these procedures, see how they are applying in practice, and also refine them with additional information, be it case histories, numerical modeling, or centrifuge testing. Professor Idris has also published numerous papers, and several of them are something that is, if you're not aware of, you need to actually go and look at those publications, uh, and you will learn a lot from them. But more importantly, Professor Idris is really a role model for all of us, and with, for that, I'm going to relate a personal anecdote. Uh, Professor Idris and I have interacted on, for a number of years, and um, I've always looked at uh, you know, his work, and we start, and you know, it's just, for me, he's a giant in our profession. And uh, we started talking about some of the work we have been doing at Illinois on site response. And Professor Idris says, I want to come to Illinois, spend a week to learn about the work you're doing. This is fairly recent, last couple of years. He came in, spent an entire week with us at Illinois, not teaching us, but also learning from our students. The students absolutely adored him, in inter just had a joy interacting with him. Actually also, 
we had the opportunity to invite Professor Idris to our house for some good food. And my kids, my two daughters, just absolutely enjoyed his company. Why? Because I thought that was, you know, Professor Idris visited us and that would be the end of it. He said, you know, Yusuf, I really want to come again to learn a little bit more. And so, about a year later, he comes and joins us. And my kids tell us, tell, told me, oh, Professor Idris is here. We really have to have him at our house. And again, we ha enjoyed having him. The students enjoyed interacting with him. And also, Professor Idris uh, happened to visit us a third time. Now, this is not just unique to Illinois. I also know that Professor Idris has visited a number of uh, universities whereby he reached out to learn from the students. He exemplifies lifelong learning. So with that, and without further introduction, I would like to invite Professor Idris to the podium and please join me, join me in welcoming him. Thank you very much, uh, Yusuf. That was a very kind and uh, wonderful introduction. I appreciate that. But before I start, I really would like to take this opportunity to congratulate the students on the, all the awards they received this evening. It was wonderful to see them all rushing up the stairs to get that, that award. It's absolutely marvelous. And I'm sure either one or three or four or five will be standing here 20, 30 years from now and be doing exactly what some of us have been doing. So congratulations and all the best in your future. Uh, I guess I better get on to the lecture. Could we uh, project the first slide or should I do that? I think I, oh, there we go. This is the title of my lecture this, this evening and it's regarding the response of soil size during earthquakes, a topic I've started working on starting in 1964 and probably hasn't, haven't stopped yet. And so I'm gonna give you a 60 year perspective on that, including some a little bit of history, a little bit of new stuff, a little bit of old stuff, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, so to speak. And just to acknowledge the fact that this is the Terzaghi lecture, I thought I'd show the, that photo in case some of you have not seen that photo of Professor uh, Terzaghi, <clears throat> who passed away in 1963, so I never had a chance to meet him, but he certainly is the father of soil mechanics. We all acknowledge that. Now, the topics I'm gonna cover today are these. First, why do we con are concerned with site response? Then I'll uh, take a little side step and look at some recorded ground motions and see what we learn, what we have and what we, have, what we can glean out of them. Then uh, since we have all these uh, recorded motions, a lot of people have been doing a lot of, lots of efforts over the years and now it's even uh, more so in the past uh, 10 years or so to develop earthquake ground motions that allow us to estimate what the future might uh, produce. In other words, if there's an earthquake at a certain location caused by at a, at a certain source, what would be the nature of those ground motions that we might expect there? So that's it's known as the earthquake ground motion models. There have been uses of like uh, GMPEs and all that wonderful uh, acronyms, which I particularly don't uh, care for much. So I prefer to use uh, earthquake ground motion models, and I prefer to use the word estimate rather than predict. It's a much more pertinent way to look at this picture. And then I'll take a little uh, side, uh, side trip looking over the historical perspective and what we, how, how things got started and, and so on and so forth. And then I've stepped back again and take a, take a look at one specific site the uh, Treasure Island site in the, Bay, in the San Francisco Bay Area, which was subjected or, uh, to a big earthquake in 1989, the Loma Prieta earthquake. Look at how well can we do in terms of site response at that particular site, and then compare it to the things we've been doing over the last uh, um, 10 years using equilinear solutions, and then step off and look at what other procedures could we use and how well all of these things fit together. And finally, I'll have a few concluding remarks 
and a couple of recommendations. So let's get started. So why site response? Typically, we are looking at uh, a structure like a nice bridge, and I happen to have worked on that uh, new East Bay span in, in the San Francisco Bay Area. And somebody was mentioning something about the duration of a project. That started in 1990, and finally the, the bridge was opened in 2013. So it's not unusual to go on and on and on some of these projects. Or a nuclear power plant, such as the, this one in uh, Florida. Oh, sorry, this is the <laughs> Diablo Canyon in California. And, or some high-rise buildings in downtown San Francisco or any other big city anywhere in the world. So what we are really looking for in terms of how to evaluate these types of situations where we have a structure sitting on soils or a rock or some other formation, how do we gonna assess what is needed to look at the performance of that particular structure and therefore the, assess the, how to design it and so on and so forth. So the starting point is really looking at the half space which might be underlain by a hard rock formation or a soft rock formation or something harder than whatever we're gonna put our structure on unless we are sitting directly on that particular rock. Now we call that an, uh, an idealized outcrop. There's nothing but air above it. And this motion that we might uh, obtain at location C we typically uh, look at that in terms of a recorded motion on a, a rock outcrop. But we, s since most of the time we're not sitting on that outcrop, we typically are sitting more on top of a soil where now we need to have not, not the motion C, which we record on a rock outcrop, but the motion D, which is the one that's going to really apply to that particular, particular one. We call D the motion within, and we have procedures to go from C to D. But eventually, we really want to know what's up at A if, if, when we don't have any structure. And more importantly, we want to know what the motion is at B that will apply to a particular structure we might build over there. So we need to go all through these processes. Now, site response, the way we define site response, cannot get us to point B could get us to point A, but cannot get us to point B. To get to point B, we have to do either a soil structure interaction or possibly a soil foundation structure interaction. But wh whatever we do, we should always pay attention to what might be happening at A. And it's a, it's a remiss. I've worked on so many projects where you come in and say, tell me what's happening away from your structure. You look at it, it doesn't make any sense. So we go back to the drawing table and start all over again to make sure that make, things make sense. That's why we need to keep an eye on site response. We need to do the best job we can do with that aspect of this issue. And uh, another, another structure, this is actually my favorite structure, is an embankment dam. I, I call it, is my passion. And, uh, and typically, then, we look at that. And, and again, we need the, uh, uh, the it's very, we, we, got, we set it up so I can use the laser point, but it's not very convenient. Again, we need the, point, the, uh, the uh, motion at point B, which we borrow from a C that we, assuming there was no embankment and no foundation soils, and we put it through the system. But again, we really need to f appreciate what we might be calculating in the free field, which would be our point A when we're looking at the other, uh, say, a building or a, uh, or a bridge on top of that soil. The same thing applies in here. So regardless then, we, that's really what we're looking for. So a ground response analysis provides a means to check the results in the free field of a dynamic analysis that incorporates soil structure interaction or soil foundation interaction. Therefore, it is important to have in our computer tool bucket procedures and computer programs that we can rely on to provide us with reasonably reliable estimates. And you notice I never use accurate, say reliable estimates, and I always use the word estimate because we really don't know everything. And whatever we do is a, so we always want to look at a reasonable estimate that correlates well 
with measured values and are physically meaningful. I have worked on some project where somebody, some people come in Yucca Mountain with 5Gs at some locations. It's impossible for any structure to withstand that. It's impossible had it occurred and the, the area had been there for millions of years, that it would still be standing there. Therefore, that's not a physically meaningful number. It was the calculation, but it doesn't mean it's useful or meaningful. So we always have to check on that. So let's just look and see how can we get to that point C and what are the data they're telling us uh, about that. So the next thing we're going to talk about is the recorded earthquake erosion data. And uh, the, over the last uh, 14, 15 years, starting in 2004, the NGA projects at the Peer Center in California was initiated. Initially started out with looking at uh, uh, events occurring, <coughs> shallow crustal earthquakes in active tectonic regions like California, and that project was named NGA West. It started out in 2004, was uh, uh, augmented again in 2012, and became the NGA West II. Since then, uh, th things got so, so exciting, so well, let's look at the East, and uh, East uh, and North America, and that project became the NGA East. And of course, we have many locations in the world that are affected by earthquakes occurring on subduction zones. And in the past three years, they've added the NGA subduction project. So these are three projects. And a huge amount of data has been collected. <coughs> uh, the NGA West uh, two, uh, resulted in collecting roughly 20,000 recordings, and their distribution looks something like this. And then the NGA East collected far less, uh, about 10,000 points, and they look something like this. But please notice that the maximum magnitude we have there is about six, so slightly less than six. So it's not as robust a, a data set as we have from the West. <coughs> from the West and the Subduction is far greater. We have almost 50,000 recordings, and they are uh, shown in here. They go up to almost magnitude, a uh, little over magnitude nine, the Tohoku earthquake in Japan uh, three or four years ago, and uh, are far more extensive. Now, uh, the, uh, the data out here go out to almost 2,000, uh, 1,500 kilometers because these have a far greater effect than the other earthquakes. Now, what can we glean from these? There are many ways to look at uh, these data and what we can, can and cannot learn from them, but I found that one of the more very useful things to look at is the spectrum that we get out of any, any motion. And I, I will not try to define what a spectrum in case some of you have not heard of that word before, but I'm sure most of you have, so we don't need to define it. And in particular, this is what a spectrum looks like. It's a plot of the maximum values obtained for a single degree of freedom system that's shaken by that motion that, we, that was recorded during the earthquake. And it's plotted as a uh, spectral acceleration as a function of period, the period of the single degree of freedom system. This is one typical plot uh, for one particular motion from uh, the Loma Prieta earthquake at uh, Gilroy, doesn't mean anything to us. But what I've always found extremely useful, and it really started with Professor Hausner back in the, when there were only about eight or nine recordings uh, only at that time available for the profession to look at. He took those and sort of looked at them in a way that allowed him to look at them together rather than since one of them was very low level of shaking, one was a little higher and so on and so forth by normalizing the spectrum to the peak acceleration. So you would take uh, any, any specific, any value of uh, spectral, spectral acceleration divided by the peak, the peak at a very, very, very short period, very high frequency, which basically corresponds to what we call the PGA, peak ground acceleration. So then the ratio of uh, spectral, spectral acceleration which we typically call PSA, PS, P for P, pseudo, S for spectral, and A for acceleration. So it's a pseudo-spectral acceleration. And uh, 
So if you take that PSA and divide it by uh, PGA, then you, en you end up with something like, for the same spectrum, you end up with something like this, which defines the, uh, what we call the spectral shape. And uh, we'll always, uh, obviously we'll start at one at very sh short period, and then we'll increase and we'll have a peak and the, that peak occurs at a specific period. So what I'm gonna look at in terms of the recorded motions is where does that period occur and what is it affected by? And how large is this period and what is that affected by? So if we go through and look at the, uh, the, the period at which that peak occurs, if we look at the, and, and again now since I'm really looking at that motion C, the outcrop motion, I don't, I'm gonna look at uh, uh, the only ro what we call rock sites. Uh, USGS defines a genetic rock site as having a shear velocity, VS30 it's called, of about 760 meters per second, which is roughly what, about 3,000 uh, feet per second, which is something we started with uh, many years ago as, as our uh, generic rock. But I found that even going down to as low as 600, and as high as whatever the data are available for is, is a reasonable estimate for what that uh, out, rock outcrop might be. And incident, in, interestingly, I didn't show a plot of the shear wave velocities for those recorded data. There are no data recorded on sites that have a shear wave velocity higher than about 20, 21, 2200 meters per second even in the eastern part of the United States. Actually, in the east, it's only, the maximum is 2,000 meters per second. But uh, here's the plot of that period on the, uh, <coughs> on, the, on the y axis versus magnitude of those recordings obtained on rock sites for the, uh, using the NGA West data. And practically, as you can see, there's hardly any dependence. In other words, that where that period occurs is not really dependent on the, on the, on the, on the magnitude of the earthquake. And if we look at uh, its effect of the dis distance, that the, uh, R is the distance that, that from which the earthquake was recorded, there seems to be a trend upward, and I call it a trend rather than a, rather than a best estimate or something of that sort, but it does show that as you, very close to the, <clears throat> very close to the source, 10 or 20 kilometers or so, it's practically the same constant, but it tends to increase as you get farther and farther away. This is for rock motions. And uh, then if we look at the, just to look at another set of data, which is the, what we call the soft soil sites, where the shear wave velocity is less than about 210, 215 meters per second. We don't have as many points as the rock sites, but they're still there. We see now that the dependence of this uh, uh, period at which that maximum occurs tends to be somewhat dependent on magnitude, it's the slope. Now, keep, please keep in mind that uh, since the, that this, this axis, the vertical, the y-axis is a log scale. So they, you see a lot more points below the line because they are much smaller values. So the, don't, don't use the arithmetic average, but this is sort of an average of, uh, of the data, so to speak. And if we look at for the same soft soil size, there's also a dependence on distance. Now we're showing this period versus distance. And there is a dependence. On it. it seems that, that where that period occurs is also dependent on the distance. Beyond about 20 or 30 kilometers again. But of course there are data, hardly any data less than about 20 or uh, 10 or so kilometers anyway. So we can't really depend much on that. But certainly beyond about uh, 30 or 40 kilometers, there is a tendency to increase. And again, keep in mind that these are logarithmic values, and these are far smaller than these numbers. So they, they don't weigh as much, so to speak. So what we learned from looking at those is that for a rock site, the, uh, that period is essentially, for, on rock sites, that period is essentially independent of magnitude and shear wave velocity, but it is dependent on increases with the distance. For soft soil sites, the T-max is essentially independent of VS30, 
it's a very narrow range of VS30 anyway from 100, about 100, the, max, the minimum is about 90 and the maximum is about 210. But it does depend, increase with magnitude and uh, rupture distance. So now with that background, let's now look at some of the models that have been developed over the years and see how do the models compare on that basis with these recorded data. Particularly of interest to, to me and to all of us who use the, who do soil structure interaction or looking at embankment dams or, or uh, just uh, site response, we want to know that value of C, which we will translate into B and then put it into the system to analyze the system. So let's look at how the models have done. And uh, now, Again, remind us what we're looking at is the period at which uh, the speak occurs and the maximum value of that. Oh, sorry, yeah, before I go there, because I'm trying to, to, trying to finish on time. Uh, no, first let's look at the maximum value. And the, this is the maximum value for the, the green points are for the rock sites and the uh, pink points are for the soft soil sites. As a function of magnitude, there's not much of a difference. But also notice that the least uh, ratio, the least max value of that maximum is about two. And hardly anything is, uh, in fact, there is about 97% uh, of these points are above 2.5. So as you can see that they can be quite large. So keep that in mind when we look at what these models are telling us. Uh, this is the effect on uh, shear wave velocity for that ratio, and it's, again, basically independent of that. For uh, this is a function of distance. There is a hint of maybe increasing values. Uh, this time, this ratio is arithmetic, so you can uh, average by eye where, where that number will be. There's a little hint, but it's actually the slope is extremely small, so basically it's independent of that. So we can say then, that that uh, maximum ratio is essentially independent of uh, these parameters, either magnitude, distance, or uh, shear wave velocity. Now let's look at the uh, ground motion models. So first we're gonna look at uh, uh, rock sites, and we look a little bit at so soft soil sites. And for that purpose, I've uh, taken uh, three magnitudes, five and a half, six and a half, and seven and a half, and four distances just to see how things vary when you exercise that partic a particular model. There are five uh, NGA West uh, models uh, that uh, uh, concentrate on uh, rock site, per se, and only four uh, cover the soft soil sites. I selected arbitrarily one of those, one of those models just to see what, what it looks like. So if we look now on the, uh, this is what, uh, <coughs> The, uh, the, the spectral shapes that we get when we exercise one of these uh, NGA West 2 models for a magnitude uh, five and a half at these uh, various distances. The black one is the distance of five, 10, 100, uh, 200, uh, 200 uh, kilometers you see that the ratio isn't varying that much, which corresponds to what the data tell us. The peak at which it occurs is moving. In the first uh, 30 kilometers or so, it was about the same place. But as we got to a longer, to a greater distance, it began to move out, which is exactly what the data were telling us. Therefore, this particular model works well in a gen gen general way in terms of capturing what the essence of the data are, te are telling us. If we now look at, at more than just magnitude five and a half, look at the six and a half, the same type of trend, at seven and a half, the same type of trend. So then we can get some consistent results out of these models using the uh, NGA West 2 for rock sites. Oops. What happened? Okay. Now let's look at the soft soil site. Again, this is now for a soft soil site with a shear wave velocity of 180 meters per second. And this is the five kilometers is the black line. The, re the green is the 30 and the yellow is the 100 kilometer and the blue is the uh, 200 kilometers. 
totally inconsistent with the recorded data. As you get farther away, actually, the, the period began to get shorter. And then you jump over here, and the period really uh, gets longer. And the ratios are somewhere in the, th in the three, two and a half to three. And as we go to other magnitudes, this is the five and a half, the six and a half, the same, this exactly the same trend. The five, the five kilometers is here, and then the 10 and 20 are here. And then you get to the seven and a half, and things get even wilder. Therefore, they really are not robust enough to capture uh, what's happening at point A if the soil site below point A is a soft soil site. I didn't try to see what's in between, because I personally have no interest in calculating those numbers for a site. Uh, uh, be, uh, what I want to do is be, when I do an analysis, I can't do that using empirical relationships. I have to do an actual analysis by starting out with the, with the level C that I convert to B and then put through the system to get the response of the structure, which is really what I'm interested in, whether it's a dam or a bridge or, or a high-rise building. So uh, the only reason I want to know what's happening at A is if see if my calculations when I use the entire system correlate well either with recorded motions or with a response calculation that's independent of that particular analysis procedure. So that's really what I'm emphasizing here. So the real interest is knowing that we can empirically derive these, use these ground motion models to derive, the, to estimate the value at point C that we convert B, the B and then use it in our uh, full system analysis. So basically then, I get comfort out of looking at this that we can rely in a reasonable way on that, on that attaining that value of C that we can proceed to continue on. So let's, uh, this is basically what I just said. So accordingly, it is appropriate to use the empirically derived earthquake ground motion models to estimate spectral values at a rock site, which becomes the rock outcrop for a specific application. Okay. Now let's uh, take a little bit side trip, look at the, what happened over the years. Uh, impact concern with site response and the effect of earthquake, the effect of local site conditions on ground motions started way before anybody was thinking about it and before any computers were in existence. So it started out with the observations. There were some differences in the response in, in the San Francisco area in 1906. And Lawson in, uh, emphasized the effects of local site conditions. In fact, at that time, there was speculation about looking at uh, some response attempts that were made to explain these effects using wave propagation theories, which existed at that time, but we didn't have the means to calculate things in a very complicated way, but it was not possible possible at that time to go beyond a qualitative expression. So we, we know we need to worry about that. And it really wasn't until the 1950s when Professor Kanai in Japan proposed using uh, wave propagation theory. The, and I intentionally did not put a, an equation, uh, Jean, Jean Brieux, <laughs> Jean Louis, <laughs> just, just so you won't say I put an equation. <laughs> I could have put one here. <laughs> and. Uh, to, to show that you can get differences. And he was measuring, that, he started measuring at that time, actually, um, uh, micro tremor motions and showed there's a huge difference between what you record on a soil site compared to a rock site or on a softer site compared to a harder site. So that was the start of worrying about the site effects. Uh, Professor Martin Duke, who at the time uh, was at UCLA, visited uh, Japan in, uh, in, in the late 50s and came back in 1958 and started saying, we need to pay attention to this issue. But then our structural friends said, nah, this is not important. So nothing happened. Then uh, let's summarize what uh, a few of the things that happened in the 1960s. The late Professor Seed drew the paper for the World Conference that was held in New Zealand in 1960 talking about the potential effects of local site conditions on earthquake ground motions. 
And uh, by the way, the, this, su this little summary is actually what I had in my thesis at that time when I wrote it in 1960, uh, uh, late 65, early 66, before I graduated. And it was about five, pa uh, three pages, I think, long. So <laughs> nowadays you have to have about 50. <laughs> and, when exa and looking at what's been going on, also found out that uh, Don Hudson, who was a professor at Caltech at the time, actually I had taken all his courses and uh, theory of vibration when I was a student at Caltech. And he actually had proposed, based on some measurements of buildings in Hawaii, that uh, we should be using values of damping that are a function of the level of deformation of the building. But he did not suggest any change in, in uh, modulus, or uh, in, in, in the, in, oh, but only, only in the damping values. And uh, in the uh, about 62, 63, uh, thereabouts, uh, Professor Penzine and uh, Professor, the late Professor Seed and a doctoral student, uh, Parmalee at the time, actually had a project to look at the response of a bridge in, uh, near Monterey, which is actually gonna cross an area that had very soft soils. And they decided they, to be able to do that, they really need to have some nonlinearity incorporated in the system. And they developed what they called, what was, what, what was a, uh, a bilinear, procedures, in other words, representing the hysteretic loop as a bilinear system. And uh, so that was available to us at that time. And uh, then uh, uh, Jeff Martin, who uh, had to go back to New Zealand uh, when he just finished his PhD at Berkeley in 1965. And in his thesis, he had worked on earth dams and had measured some vibrations in the, on a dam in, uh, in Marin County, suggested that we should be thinking about incorporating the influence of the level of shaking in calculating the response of dams. I actually had done the calculations for his thesis using the triangular wedge, but using constant values of damping and constant values of, of uh, modulus, independent of whatever the level of shaking is. And his paper with the late Professor Seed is still referenced once in a while these days. It's been a very valuable paper. That was in 1965. Then I discovered that uh, Jerry Thiers, who just graduating about a year before me, I think, had done some tests on Young Bay Mud and uh, uh, using free vibrations and, uh, and, for, and forced vibrations on some clay, clay soils. And looking at those tests, it became very obvious that the damping values, either based on uh, logarithmic decrement or on the area of the, of, of the loop, and the modulus uh, were dependent on the level of strain that was imposed on the sample. So that was beginning to germinate the idea of we need to now look at putting that together. And, uh, and I kept that sort of uh, low, I wrote it in my thesis that we should look at that because I wanted to get my thesis done and get out and have, a, have this, the PhD. Because all, we always, I always remind, remind the students, the purpose of the thesis is not to, to get a Nobel Prize. The purpose of the thesis is to, get, to graduate. So once you graduate, then you can use some useful, useful, useful work. So the first thing actually I did after I graduated was to go and program the Parmalee uh, program on bilinear and run it and compare it to uh, what is it I need to do in the other program that was sort of uh, linear, basically. Uh, what did I needed to do so I can get the same answer? So that became the basis for developing the equivalent linear procedure. And uh, to that extent, then, you take the hysteric loop, you convert it. This is what Parmalee had done. Uh, it is converted to a bilinear loop. And then when I ran the specific problem, uh, oh, sorry, and then from that loop, then we can represent it instead of the two, two moduli in the bilinear system, two, two moduli, the, uh, the loading and, down, and uh, unloading uh, moduli, and of course, the way the loop changes in size will dictate the amount of energy dissipated. Instead of doing that, then, oops, always keep doing the wrong thing here, is then to take the slope between the two points of the loop to, to uh, 
construct an equivalent uh, modulus and to take the area. And again, sorry, Jean Lou, but uh, I did have to have show an equation here <laughs> uh, to show the amount of damping, which is the, based on the area of the loop. And then when you run the analyses, then you're going to capture many loops. You take those, average out the modulus, average out the damping, run the linear program, compare it to the result using those values, the average modulus and damping. And this is what we get when you look at the uh, uh, velocity spectrum. This is instead of plotting the uh, pseudo spectral acceleration, you plot the pseudo relative velocity as a function of period. And this is the bilinear solution. This is the equivalent linear solution. And the, just by eye, you can see they are, they're pretty close, almost identical, actually. And on the right-hand side is the uh, acceleration spectrum. And that was really, and then we developed a procedure that you go in and you iterate. And you get the, uh, that's how the equivalent linear procedure works. So, uh, and uh, what happened also in the early 60s is Independently of whatever was going on at uh, UC Berkeley uh, and independently of what was going on at, at MIT, where Ricardo Dobri came a few years later and started working in this arena, but uh, Rosette was already there and Bob Whitman was there and they were working in a different avenue but not looking at it the same way we were. But independent of all, all to, both of us, actually the Professor Richard at the University of Michigan had some very bright students, and uh, Ken hadn't got arrived there yet. <laughs> it took him a, it was about another few years after that. They started running uh, vi uh, uh, free vibration, force vibration tests, and, and so on and so forth, and started uh, issuing re reports on the modulus and damping values that they obtained, and ex they expressed it in terms of the app amplitude of the change in the, in the modulus, which was easy to convert to strain. So we took all of those data, plus a few others, and uh, the late Professor Seed and I prepared a report in, uh, in 19, this was late, late 60s, mid to late 60s, we were collecting all this information. Finally, we wrote a report in, uh, it was published in, by EERC, which is the Earthquake Engineering Research Center at the University of California. And uh, as part of that report, actually, the, I, the idea of using G over G max was, uh, was created. So the, we did that report introduced that concept. And this is that, uh, that idea, that figure comes from that report. And since then, of course, has been become sort of the standard uh, way to look at these things, even including some of the nonlinear programs. They look at G over G max to construct uh, a hysteric loop based on uh, sigmoid and all kinds of uh, wonderful expressions they, that you can see in the, in the literature. So that idea persists, and it's been be become a very useful idea. And since then, of course, many, many tests, including those that uh, Professor Ken Stokey has been uh, doing and given us uh, to use. And uh, things like this, uh, like this type of uh, figure, I, I covered the, <laughs> what they are, so because the, I'm not trying to say what is what. It's just there are a multitude of uh, relationships showing G over G max of the function of strain, similarly for, for damping. So we have a lot of information to use available to us today. And, but one of the things that I really love to make sure that we all appreciate, and I want to thank Professor Ken Stokey for giving me this, this figure, and that is that when we run laboratory tests, we probably are going to get this solid blue line, which gives us a, a way to take the maximum projected from the lab divided by, take each one of these measured G, uh, G, divided by the maximum lab value, and get G over G max. But this is really not the one to use in the, in the, in the analyses. What we should be then is upgrading that to make sure that the G max that we use is not the lab, but the shape we get from the lab is the G over G max, but the the actual value should be what we measure in the field. This is for soils, because we typically disturb the sample when we bring it to the laboratory, and therefore we're going to get a lower G max. 
but the shape should be uh, pretty, pretty close to what it should be. When we look at uh, uh, fractured rock, it's the opposite. He actually, I saw him make a presentation, and after I saw that presentation, I asked him to send me this figure. I didn't want to talk about rock. But the, uh, for rock, it gets the other way, because typically you test in the laboratory the hard pieces of rock, not the, uh, not the composite. So please make sure that we keep that in mind and therefore use the shape from the lab, but the maximum from the field. Uh, so what happened next then is that uh, some shaking table tests were being done at the University of California at Berkeley. And when we applied the finite element method that I also wrote to, to do equivalent linear analyses, we're looking at dams like the Sheffield Dam and other slopes. When we tried to see how well we captured what was measured in the shaking table test, we're getting very small values near the, the, the uh, crest of the slope. And obviously, it became very obvious that what we're doing is overestimating the damping in that area. Now, the procedures we had up to that point using uh, lump mass procedures for a single column or finite elements, we're using uh, uh, a mode, mode superposition, which requires that we have the same damping throughout the system, throughout the, throughout the structure, throughout the soil structure, throughout the soil layer, whatever it is, throughout the soil profile, actually. So we had to back off and start now looking, thinking about how do we accommodate various damping in various parts of the slope or the dam or the uh, soil profile. And to do that, we had to rewrite everything and in terms of uh, uh, varying the damping from one element to from one finite element to another. And we wrote that, of course, that required the use of Rayleigh really damping to represent the the damping in the system, and uh, that suppresses high frequencies. So we're trying to get around that, started looking at uh, the equations of motions, which allow you to use different uh, viscosity coefficients for any one part of the layer, and see how we can apply that to overcome the, what we're having. And we were not getting anywhere, so we were discussing that, professor, the late professor John Leismer, and he came up with a very bright idea. And the bright idea was to, instead of using a constant uh, viscosity in the equation of, of motion, we used, he suggested using a constant damping ratio in that equation. Ah, I'd say for now, instead of having a constant viscosity and damping ratio is dependent on frequency, we, it changed to having a constant damping ratio independent of frequency, but the viscosity, which we never measure, uh, that is now uh, dependent on frequency. Uh, but to be able to do a, uh, uh, solve the equations of motions, you need to construct the Fourier amplitudes and invert the, uh, invert the Fourier, uh, get a Fourier transform to invert the uh, process so you can calculate the time, time domain solution. And at that time, uh, Cooley and Tucky, which I talked to some people who were much, much younger than me, and they never even thought that <laughs> there was such a thing before. But that actually allowed us to, 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 to do that conversion. And uh, Schnabel was the one who was working with me at that time. And since Professor Leismer had uh, come up with that brilliant idea, I said, you two complete the process. And I was getting very busy at Woodwork Light. This was 1972. 71, 72, so, and that was actually the start of the program Shake. Uh, uh, professor Leismer, who had before that, he graduated from Michigan, by the way, but Professor Richard, uh, before that, he was concentrating his attention on fi found, uh, foundation vibration. But once we got him hooked into this, he really got involved in geotechnical earthquake engineering, and he eventually uh, revised the program, Lush, Flush, and eventually SASE, which had become the, the, the standard for soil structure interaction for nuclear power plants. So that's the history that I, in a very brief way, that's a history of about 15 years <laughs> or so. So let's now get back to our response analyses. So we're going to take the, a look at Treasure Island. And first, I'm going to walk very quickly through just using our equivalent linear, standard equivalent linear procedures. Then 
uh, I was very fortunate, as uh, Professor Hashes mentioned earlier, to uh, be able to go spend uh, a few days three, at three occasions, a total of roughly uh, about uh, 10, 12 days, uh, learning from him and from his uh, very brilliant students. The last trip was uh, with uh, a very bright young student who's soon to be Dr. Osgun uh, Naman Oglu. Uh, he's here somewhere. <laughs> and he was an excellent teacher, much better than Yusuf. <laughs> <laughs> and I really learned how to use the program. So I was able to bring that and then I Therefore, I exercise that, and the, they have it uh, able to do equivalent linear as well as nonlinear, and exercise that to show you the results. But then I decided that it's really not enough to, uh, and I started that before I was, uh, I knew I was gonna give the Terzaghi lecture, so it's nothing to do with this, because I really wanted to understand that program. Because in, in, uh, I, I still do quite a bit of consulting, and a lot of people do a lot of analyses, and you, you really have to have a way to check what they're doing. And if you can't uh, check it, uh, you, back, back of the envelope doesn't work in every case. You have to have a little, a little more useful tool than that. So that's why I was learning that. But then when I uh, was, at, was, was informed that I would be given this uh, Terzaghi, I said, well, this is a good thing to do. Maybe I was, uh, almost initially I was gonna talk about liquefaction. I said, no, 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 maybe I should do this. But then only one program is not enough. I really should learn how to use a FLAC. And there I had an, another fantastic opportunity to go spend a few, quite a few days at UC Berkeley with uh, advice from Professor Boulanger and my fantastic teacher, <laughs> Professor Katharina Giotoplo. I thank you, I thank all of you for allowing me to get to this point of I'm almost at the freshman, sophomore level in uh, both of them, so I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I haven't graduated yet, but I'm okay. But, and I can run the programs, and, and they, work, they work reasonably well. So let's walk, on, look, walk through and see what we get. First, the Loma Prieta, the equivalent linear procedures, which we had done before, but i just repeat them again to make sure we get the same answers. Uh, the uh, Treasure Island is in the, this is San Francisco over here and this is Treasure Island. And right, at, in addition to having a recording at Treasure Island, there was a recording at Yerba Buena Island just a few uh, hundred meters away from it, which became our, uh, our C value, which then we can put in the program to get B and then get the response. And this is uh, how these things look. And the uh, Soil profile, there have been a lot of investigations at the Treasure Island site, so we had a fair idea of what the site conditions look like. Oops. And uh, there were several me uh, shear wave measurements from which we got the best estimate of the shear wave measurements, and then we used the uh, modulus and damping curves, which I'm not going to go into to calculate the response. This was what was measured. The Yerba Buena Island is the blue line. The, the spectrum for the uh, motion at the Yerba Buena Island is a blue curve. And uh, those at the uh, uh, Treasure Island is the black curve. And this is what we calculate with our best estimate, which looks quite, uh, quite reasonable. And uh, if we allow for variations in the properties, uh, take into account the, the maximum and the minimum shear wave velocities and so on and so forth, we get these kinds of variation. The red line is the uh, best estimate. The uh, other blue, black lines, not the very big solid black line, but the other black lines are the variations on that shear wave velocity. So it's affecting the results, but not in any particularly serious way. It certainly is not violating anything. We also noticed that uh, what if we did not have that recording in Yerba Buena Island? What if only they only had put a recording at Treasure Island? But we did have many other recordings at rock sites in the Bay Area, including one at, uh, in, Bur in Piedmont, one in Berkeley, several in, the, in San Francisco Bay Area, in the San Francisco area itself. So we said, what if we didn't have Yerba Buena? What would we get had we had no choice but to use one of the others or all of the others. And this is what we get. 
This is using the best estimate of shear wave velocity and the Buena Island and uh, input motion, which gives us a very reasonable uh, recreation of what was actually observed. Now, if we use the others, this is what we get. Totally foreign to, to this. So, be, so th that tells me that the input motion is really a very critical thing to, to look at. Now, if you take the average of all these, and I won't go into that, uh, you get a little closer, but not the same shape uh, particularly. So we, so we got to keep that in mind. Now, if we go and look at using a deep soil as uh, for comparison, oh, sorry, before I, before I say that, there was a downhole array uh, put in after Loma Prieta earthquake, and uh, they put in uh, six uh, at these various uh, levels, the surface, uh, at the interface between the uh, weathered rock and the hard rock, then at the hard rock, then uh, somewhere in between. And uh, we have recordings from several earthquakes. The maximum sh uh, peak acceleration at the surface is about 2% G, very low. Actually, I've gone through uh, about three or four out of those six or seven record uh, motions. They're pretty, we get pretty close no numbers, so I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna repeat them today. We just move on to looking at the comparison with other programs, including the uh, equivalent linear using uh, uh, deep soil. And this is what the results look like. Again, quite uh, uh, very similar to the, oh, it's almost identical to the other, to the equivalent linear using shake, so as, it, as it should be. And if we use the, so this is now the comparison, you can see they're almost identical. If we now use the nonlinear solution, this is what it looks like. And uh, then we can move on to using uh, FLAC. So you can uh, see what that, what that looks like, which is a totally different, uh, it's a finite difference procedure. And the, uh, the, the um, assumption regarding how you uh, handle uh, nonlinearities are different from deep soil. So let's see what, uh, what the results will be. They all start out with the same layering, the same uh, unit weights, the same shear strength, the same uh, maximum uh, shear wave velocity. But once beyond that, they are totally different. So we'll see what they look like. And uh, of course, uh, Professor Boulanger and Professor Diotoplo had developed the PM4 sand, which we used in the sand part of the profile. And then uh, last uh, summer, they also developed the PM4 silt, which is applicable to silty soils, and uh, also they suggest using it for uh, clay soils. So uh, initially, we ran some results in my first visit to uh, Berkeley back in August, use, using uh, the PM4 sand for the, for the sand, but for the clay, we were using the hysteretic model because they hadn't yet uh, completed all their work on PS, uh, PM4 silt at that point, and we got certain results, which I'll show you shortly. I, I went back in December, and by then, they felt very comfortable uh, about uh, letting me use the PM4 silt, which we imported into the, uh, the process, and we made the calculations all over again. So let's walk through and see what we get out of that. Uh, if we use the... Uh, Hysteretic model with the Young Bay mud and the PM4 sand for the sand fill and, uh, and other sand layers, we get this response, which is still, in terms of shape, is very reasonable. It overestimates the values a little bit. You can tell the difference. Uh, the blue one, the light uh, cayenne is called, is that what they call it, cayenne, is the, uh, is the results of the analyses. When we make the adjustment to uh, put PM4 silt, it improves the situation significantly. Uh, plus, we, by having uh, PM4 silt, then we can monitor the development of pore pressures in the, in the clay, which we, I'll show you uh, shortly. But uh, what's really interesting is uh, if we look at all these analyses that we've done for uh, Treasure Island, whether it is shake equivalent linear, uh, Equivalent linear with deep soil, nonlinear with deep soil, nonlinear with uh, flak. Look at the spectral shape. What do they look like? This is the recorded motion, the spectral shape of the recorded motion, starting at one at a uh, very high fre frequency, uh, low, low period. 
And this is when we add, uh, this is when we look at the flak analyses with, with the hysteric, hysteric or PM4 sand. The shapes are not that different. The values are different, but the shapes are not that different. If we add to that uh, the uh, deep soil nonlinear, they're almost uh, identical to each other. If we add uh, the shake, the shake now doesn't look so good. <laughs> so, <laughs> and uh, this is what they, they compare. So uh, it, feel, it makes me feel very comfortable that we have a procedure that can reproduce what was recorded. And I've done it a couple other sites, so I just don't have time to show you everything here today. But, and they give comparable results, so it's not, uh, it's not a fluke. <laughs> And uh, so this, this is very, very fun. Now let's look at what we also can get out of the uh, flak analyses, the development of excess pore water pressure. Uh, well, this is, we monitored the excess pore water pressure within the sand below the water table, thinking it might be liquefaction. And in the, in the clay layer at a depth of 20 meters, 20 and a half meters, and the uh, sand layer at about eight, or eight and a half meters. And uh, this is what it looks like in the sand layer. Very low, uh, this is in terms of RU. Uh, the uh, vertical scale, these are RU or the acceleration that's uh, uh, being induced in, in that, at that particular depth. And you can see that the R, R, RU for the, in the sand is very low, it's about 4%. There's no way it can be not anywhere near liquefaction. Now, the actual observation, there was liquefaction at Treasure Island, but this, the sand boils were roughly 100 meters away from, uh, from, the, uh, from the recording station. For the clay, however, there was a significant uh, development of pore pressure. 20% uh, is not an insignificant pore pressure. That would reduce the strength by 20%. And this is a very low level of shaking, 7% uh, at the base and 16% at the crest, at the top of the soil profile. So, we, uh, so that we, we really need to uh, use uh, things like PM4 silt that allows us to look at the uh, pore pressure generation and uh, the dissipation. As you can see that once the major part of the shaking uh, went on, it started dissipating. Not very rapidly, for the sand it dissipated, of course, much more rapidly, as we would expect. So then, uh, some concluding remarks. The equivalent linear procedure has been and continues to be widely used in practice for calculating the response and for developing site-specific earthquake ground motions and design parameters. It has also been widely used for other structures when you, in, in, within finite, the final element procedure. The, uh, and advances in nonlinear analyses are encouraging, and the results presented today highlight the value of using such analyses. Care must be exercised in selecting appropriate constitutive models for the various soil layers comprising the profile in consideration. Calibration, this is a very critical point, of the selected constitutive model with relevant test data and empirical correlations is essential. Professor Hashash and his collaborators have done that for the model built into deep soil. Professors Boulanger and Ziotopolo and their collaborators have done that extensively for PM4 sand and are continually adding to that effort for PM4 soil. The results at Treasure Island site using PM4 silt for the Young Bay mud layer highlight the importance of accounting for pore water pressure increases and for the possibility of cyclic softening. The, uh, from doing this and uh, about uh, 10 or 20,000 other analyses I've done over the last 50 years, I, th I find that these are the four things that affect the results. The most important is the input motion, the soil profile, the soil properties, and the method of analysis. Uh, in in uh, the method of analysis, uh, I really haven't done enough to, to, to say whether it is as important as the others right now. It, in terms of absolute numbers, it has an effect. In terms of shape, uh, spectral shape, it doesn't seem to have much, much effect for these levels of shaking. So that, but I know for sure that input motion has a, a profound influence on the results. So please be, be uh, judicious in selecting the input motion years. 
So a few recommendations, and I emphasize that with the word please. Limit the use of the equivalent linear procedure to those in which the calculated effective strain is less than about 0.6%, which corresponds to, since we use a factor to reduce the maximum strain, something a little less than about 1% strain. I have seen many people produce results with 2 or 3% strain. That's hogwash. So please don't do that or don't allow that to be done. For a deconvolution analysis, this is something we did, I didn't discuss, but I thought I would just bring that point up. I have found it useful to get the strain compatible properties by completing the analysis with a low cutoff frequency, say about 5 hertz, depending on the level of shaking, then using the resulting strain compatible modulus and damping values for one iteration and a desired cutoff frequency, usually 20 to 30 hertz. This is very important for nuclear plant projects, other projects not as significant. But sometimes using FLAC you do deconvolution. So if you're not careful in selecting the properties to do the convolution with, you can get some very crazy uh, B level. The B motion is what you get from the deconvolution. Uh, and, and then allow for variations in shear wave velocities and in modulus reduction and damping curve within physically, physically meaningful ranges. When using a randomizing process, and this just makes me wild sometimes when I see some people coming in and having a beautifully measured shear wave profile with a little variations, and then suddenly they say, we use this randomizing process, and what result did you, did you have? Suddenly the shear wave velocity in a fairly dense sand is 100 meters per second. It doesn't make any sense. So please, whenever using a randomizing process to allow for variations in these properties, be sure to check that any realization of that randomizing is physically meaningful. And finally, regarding these recommendations, Casagrande in his Azagi lecture, which is, was number two, Peck gave number one, emphasized the need to select probable, he didn't say possible, he said probable, range of pertinent soil properties guided by judgment, judgment, and experience. This is a valuable and timeless advice we should all heed. Some parting thoughts. Confucius said, life is really simple, but we insist on making it complicated. Look at what's going on. <laughs> Open any TV channel <laughs> and you'll know. And of course, uh, I, uh, Einstein took a different, slightly different, so everything should be made as simple as possible, but no simpler. And I think that's what we've done with site response. We made it as simple as possible, but no simpler. Finally, let me take a few minutes, although I may go over, but I go over, just to acknowledge a few people. Uh, I'm, I'm absolutely most grateful to my family for continuing love, support, and especially tolerance. And uh, make sure I don't forget anybody. And I'm eternally grateful to numerous very talented friends and colleagues. Let me just mention a few. I'll start way back from my days at Caltech and uh, thank professor, the late Professor Hausner for his wonderful guidance at that time and later as I got to know him back in the late 80s, serving with him on a board for the state of California, this shaky board, and then for the uh, uh, Caltrans uh, Seismic Advisory Board and the Governor's Board of Inquiry. He was, just, he was an absolutely marvelous person to listen to. I always uh, think, think of every time I heard you talk, I sort of threw a sponge at him to absorb anything he says. So that's how, how fantastic he was. And in my days at Berkeley, and I certainly can never forget how, how valuable it was to have an association, one of the most mar marvelous people you can ever work with, the late Professor Seed, from 1962, when I was 63 when I got to know him. Before that, he was the big professor giving us a lecture <laughs> until he passed away in 1989. So that was very, and I, he was my consultant on, at Woodward Clyde all that time. So we always met with him quite often. So he was fabulous. And two, uh, three other people from uh, 
from uh, the Berkeley days, uh, two of whom I can continue to be affiliated with and uh, work with, and uh, Professor Jim Mitchell, who, who's been a fantastic friend, esteemed colleague, and a, and a wonderful mentor. Thank you very much, Jim. You've been a wonderful person to be associated with. And unfortunately, Mike Duncan couldn't be here. But he also had a lot of support and influence and uh, love for, for a very nice relationship. He was also my consultant on all the work we did at Woodwork Light, and I've seen him, continue to see him later on. Uh, two others from Berkeley days, uh, Ken Lee, who passed away uh, very immature, very immaturely or very, very uh, unexpectedly in 1978, which was a, a something bad. And of course, John Leisman was very helpful. Uh, I didn't work with him as closely as with the others. And then I worked for 20 years at Woodwork Clyde, and there were some wonderful people there. Uh, Lloyd Clough, many of you know him. Yves Lacroix, I think you mentioned him yesterday. He was uh, a fantastic person. Uh, Maury Power, some of you know him. Uh, Yoshi Moriwaki, John Barnish, and the one and only Ricardo Dobri. Some, some of you may or may not know that he worked at Uber Clyde for about five years. So we worked together quite, quite a bit. And we've, uh, we've been very good friends and, esteem, and very, he's a very esteemed colleague ever since. So thank you, Ricardo. And congratulations on getting the Middlebrook Award today. And uh, then I moved on to the University of California at Davis, and my assignment there was to uh, get the uh, Geotechnical Center off and running, and without, without the centrifuge, it could never happen. And without uh, Bruce Cutter, we could have never put the centrifuge in because he, 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 he made it work. <laughs> I, I was helpful in getting some funding, but he made it work. Without him, it could have never ever happened. And uh, of course, uh, uh, having about 20, seven years or so with Professor Seed have been duplicated as well and as nicely and as effectively and as wonderfully with, the, with Professor Ross Boulanger since 1991. I really appreciate that, Ross. And of course, now we have Jason, who is a fantastic uh, young professor, and the one and only Katerina. Thank you very much. You're a fantastic teacher. Without you, I wouldn't know how to run Slack. <laughs> Plus many other things. And over the years, I also had some associations, some wonderful people whom I never really, uh, well, I did work with uh, Ken a couple times, but uh, Ken Stokey and Tom O'Rourke really deserve my absolute thanks for association over the last, for Ken, it's almost for, uh, since 71 or two. That gets you close to 50, year, 50 years now, almost. And for uh, Tom, uh, it's the late 80s, starting in Buffalo. <laughs> and it's been absolutely marvelous. And of course, uh, I work on uh, quite a few consulting assignments uh, throughout the world. And you meet with some absolutely fantastic uh, individuals, either uh, joint uh, board members or the clients themselves or the engineers working on the project. It's been absolutely marvelous. And one of those is sitting here is uh, Alex C. Thank you, Alex. And so with that, I also want to thank ASC, those who took the effort to nominate me if that was required, and I assume it was since I'm involved in nominating others. The other. I thank all those that nominated me. I thank the board for uh, seeing the wisdom. <laughs> and uh, for this great honor. I really appreciate it. And thank you very, very much for being very attentive. I didn't see anybody sleeping. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>